Thanks to the biology department for having me. It's an honor to be here talking about sweating. So Dr. Brody um, already gave you some of my background, but basically the long story short of how I got here is I've been a high school teacher for 14 years. And at some point I decided um, we needed to be teaching kids about human evolution because actually most states don't. Only four states actually have um, human evolution in the teaching standards. Massachusetts is not one of them. So um, in developing a unit on human evolution, um, I came across an article by uh, Dennis Bramble and Dan Lieberman uh, on the evolution of human running and how endurance running may have influenced the evolution of the genus Homo. And so that was kind of the, the first big spark for me um, where I realized I could connect uh, the thing that I do in my free time, which is running, um, with my teaching. And I decided, you know, I think I actually want to become a scientist um, as opposed to just teaching it. And so that's brought me to where I am today. Um, I knew I was interested in the evolution of human endurance. And I was thinking something along the lines of heat, you know, how do humans get rid of heat? How did that influence our evolution? Um, and a meeting between myself and Dan Lieberman, um, the author of this, this paper here, sort of my science hero, actually uh, um, led me to these very specific questions, which I'll talk about later, uh, which have to do with the evolution of sweating um, in the human genus and how we sweat today and what is the diversity in how humans sweat, right? So that's how I got here. <clears throat> so I want to frame the talk today uh, by sort of making a thesis, making an argument, which is that humans have evolved to sweat and that sweating is uh, a big and underappreciated part of what made us human. So here's sort of the consensus view of what has made us human, right? So big human evolutionary milestones, the evolution of bipedalism, walking on two legs, right? Um, which early in our ancestors was necessary uh, for foraging and then eventually scavenging and hunting uh, in increasingly hot open environments, right? It's more efficient if you're on two legs. Um, and once our diet shifted and we were able to get enough calories in this harsh new environment, uh, that, that fueled the evolution of big brains, right? So big brains are actually pretty rare in the animal kingdom. And if big brains were such a good thing, we'd see it everywhere, we don't. So all the conditions had to be right for big brains to finally evolve. And of course, big brains uh, can eventually lead to culture, um, human intelligence, all the things we think of as being human today. And my argument is that all of this depended in part on sweating. So each of these evolutionary shifts that we think of as these are the things that made us human, um, none of them could have happened if we didn't have an incredible capacity to shed heat uh, through sweating. <clears throat> so, uh, talk today, we're gonna go through five main points. First, how unique and effective is human sweating? Because if it's not very unique or not very effective, why am I here, right? So, spoiler, it's unique and effective. Um, number two, we're gonna look at uh, some comparative primatology, look at other living primates and see how they sweat and what can that tell us about the evolution of human sweating. Um, and then we'll dig deeper back into the evolutionary past, look at how sweating first helped our ancestors forage for food and later helped our genus become fully human in all the ways I just mentioned. Um, and I'll end today by talking about my current research looking at diversity um, in human sweat gland density in living people. So let's start here. How unique and effective is human sweating? Well, actually, I'm going to back it up a step and just tell you um, why we even care. Why do any things need, why do any living organisms need to cool off? Well, heat presents one of the main challenges to life, right? So cell chemistry in every living thing, um, it requires a very narrow temperature regulation. Too cold and the enzymes that make cell chemistry possible um, can't work fast enough and too hot and those enzymes lose their shape, they denature and the chemistry of life actually completely stops. So every living thing uh, has a very narrow range of temperature that it needs to maintain. But that same chemistry of life is also very inefficient. It produces lots of heat and that represents lost energy, right? So um, thinking back to your high school biology class or your bio 101 if you're a college student, um, how do your cells actually get energy out of the food you eat? Well, um, in the process of extracting energy out of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, which some of you may remember you store as ATP, it's that molecule that cells use kind of like a rechargeable battery. Um, you lose something like 40% of the energy in that process. It's actually uh, just lost as heat. So at the level of individual mitochondria in all of your cells, um, getting energy out of your food is very inefficient. So all of your cells are producing heat as part of that. And there's further energetic losses um, when you're using ATP to actually do mechanical work, 
right? Best example would be making a muscle contract and actually doing work against something in the environment. There's further losses there. So in both of these ways, uh, anytime a cell is actually generating energy, it's producing lots of heat. Now that's great if you're a mammal living in a cold environment or a human living in a cold environment, that heat is helpful. It lets mammals live in cold environments. But if you're exercising at all, doing any physical activity, or if it's warm out, uh, that heat can become lethal and you have to get rid of it. So given that, you might expect that lots of animals sweat. Well, they don't. Here's the tree of life. And let's uh, zoom in on who actually sweats. It's really just a couple groups of mammals who are capable of cooling off through sweating. And that's too small. I know that's not fair, so we'll zoom in. And basically, we've got horses, camels, and sheep. Um, a couple species in that group can sweat. They do it a different way than we do. So the sweat glands you have in your armpits and your pubic region, uh, they're a different kind of sweat gland than what covers your body. Right? They're called apocrine sweat glands. And um, horses and camels have uh, sort of co-opted that sweat gland. It's spread to their body surface and they use that to cool, right? It's an example of convergent evolution, solving the same problem. It's hot, how do we cool off? Their solution was to use those sweat glands. The solution for some primates, as we'll see, <clears throat> um, is to take sweat glands that were on the hands and the fingers and the toes and spread them to the rest of the body um, and use them for cooling. So sweating, uh, is actually pretty rare in the animal world. So how does sweating work? Well, um, you've got something like 2 million sweat glands, exactly how many and what the variation is is the subject of my research. Uh, they're about three to five millimeters deep in your skin. They look like this. There is a uh, coiled tubule portion at the bottom, uh, deeper in your skin where sweat is actually produced. Um, and the sweat is forced up the duct and um, out onto your skin. And the way that it works is uh, when your body needs to cool, um, blood vessels, tiny capillaries in your skin open up, bringing hot blood to the surface of your skin. And the sweat that's secreted onto your skin is then driven off uh, by the heat from your skin. So it's basically um, taking advantage of physics, right? Um, taking heat away from your skin, cooling the blood in your skin, and that cools off um, your, your core temperature. So in humans, um, we have a lot of plasticity with sweating, meaning we can become better at sweating, worse at sweating, really depending on how much we use it. So kind of like other exercise capacities, it's use it or lose it, right? So what are some things that happen when you start to heat acclimate, meaning you start exercising in the heat? Well, number one, you get an increased sweat rate. So your body is basically saying, this idiot is gonna get hot and we wanna start sweating right away um, to lower core temperature before it becomes problematic. So you may notice in the summer, uh, the first couple days that it's really hot, you're not sweating as much and you're really uncomfortable. Within a few weeks, you're acclimated and part of the reason is that you're sweating more and you're sweating earlier, right? Um, that only works if you have more blood. So every time you're making sweat, you are basically pulling water out of your blood plasma and so your blood is getting thicker and there's less blood volume to go around and do all the things blood does. So another adaptation you get pretty quickly is increased blood volume. Uh, you also have lower exercising heart rate. This is really just a reflection of you know, the fact that you're more heat acclimated, um, your core temperature isn't rising as much, you can sweat more, you've got more blood, uh, so your heart doesn't have to work as hard during exercise. Right? And your body is also thinking, um, this guy, again, is gonna get hot. I don't know why he's doing that. I'd better uh, buffer against that by just um, making less heat in the first place. So your overall metabolic rate and therefore your core temperature actually decreases a little bit when you're heat acclimated, right? So let's look at some primates. So sweat glands don't fossilize. So if we wanna talk about how did sweating evolve, we can't just look back in the fossil record. You're not gonna see sweat glands. You can't just go count them. So one thing we can do is look at living primates. Now, why would we do that? Um, well, anyone in the room who's a biologist, you're keenly aware that sometimes we like to do comparative biology, right? And that's look at different living groups uh, compare the similarities and differences and work backwards and that tells us something about how each group evolved to be different. So we can do that with primates, more specifically apes. So here are the living apes. <clears throat> Humans are included of course because we are apes. And for sweating specifically, if we can learn something about sweating in living primates, uh, that tells us something about how sweating evolved in our lineage because our sweating is very different, right? So that's what we're going to do. Oh by the way, uh, in case 
anyone has any misconceptions about this, we do not look at chimps because uh, we evolved from them. We did not, right? Chimpanzees are a new species, just, are, just as every other ape is, just as humans are. Instead, we share a common ancestor with chimps, right? So they're like our evolutionary cousins. Okay. So let's talk about our sweaty primate relatives. Uh, here we've got a chart, a, a cladogram showing uh, many different species of living primates. And we know that most primates, um, things like your uh, lemurs and lorises, uh, they do not sweat to cool. They don't seem capable of it. And that's simply because they don't have sweat glands on their whole body surface. They only have it on their hands and feet. They can't use them for cooling, right? But the primates most closely related to us, the catarines, so African and Asian monkeys and apes, um, sweat glands spread to the whole body surface and they can sweat to cool. In fact, we now know that chimpanzees do respond to thermal stress by sweating. And in fact, uh, there was some recent research showing chimps living in marginal zones uh, during drought, uh, where they're having the fallback foods, stuff that's not as tasty because uh, it's too hot, too dry. Uh, they're also showing signs of heat stress and dehydration. So this sort of indirect evidence that chimpanzees, uh, like humans, are using sweating as a way to buffer um, against hot and dry climates, right? So let's look a, uh, look a little more closely at the evolution of sweating in primates. So we're all mammals, and as mammals, we have sweat glands on our fingers and toes, and those are the same kind of sweat glands that you have on the rest of your body, but rather than being used for cooling, uh, we think they're used in frictional gripping, right? So think about when your hands and feet sweat. It's when you're nervous, right? So it's linked to the fight or flight response. So somewhere around 200 million years ago, sweat glands evolved on the hands and feet of mammals, probably to help them uh, have a little bit of traction and run for their life in that moment of panic. You still have that, and that's why your hands get sweaty. And it's not until about 40 million years ago, with the evolution of catarines, or old, old world monkeys and then apes, um, that we have eccrine sweat glands, the kind of sweat gland that helps you cool, actually spread from the hands and feet to the rest of the body. Right. So about 40 million years ago, we finally see the origins of human sweating ability. <clears throat> about 20 million years ago, with the evolution of apes, a specific groups of primate living in Africa, right? Um, we see one really important change, and that is a drastic reduction in hair density. So a recent study shows, I think, um, chimps have something like, so chimps are, are apes, right? They have anywhere from two to 21 times less hair density, you know, depending on the body region, than monkeys do. So about 20 million years ago, we don't see very many more sweat glands evolving, uh, but we see a drastic reduction in hair, and that's important because hair, like clothing, blocks sweating, blocks swe uh, sweat evaporation. But it gets really interesting in the human lineage, which we'll zoom in on in a moment, and somewhere between one and three million years ago, we have a huge, really tenfold increase in the number of sweat glands covering our body, right? And at the same time, we have more hair reduction, although actually you're just as hairy as any other ape. Um, you have the same number of hairs per square centimeter. It's simply that uh, they're shorter, they're microscopic, they're unpigmented, so they don't get in the way as much. So humans really are not the naked ape. Um, we're the ape who's, who looks naked, right? All right, so uh, a couple years ago, my advisor, Dr. Camilar, and I looked at some old data um, where they sampled uh, sweat gland characteristics from a bunch of different primate species. <coughs> and we analyzed this using new methods that weren't available back, back then. We did a phylogenetic analysis, which basically means um, looking at sweat gland traits between these living species, um, are they more or less similar than you'd expect based on how closely related species are? And we found that living primates who live in hot, dry climates uh, tend to have more glycogen in their sweat glands than other primates do. Now, glycogen, if anyone here is an athlete, uh, that's how you store uh, glucose. So really, it's an onboard fuel source for your sweat glands to produce sweat. So we interpreted this as evidence that um, primates today living in hot, dry climates have sweat glands that are better able to sweat. Right. And we did find evidence that this is due to natural selection. So this is, um, this is evolutionary adaptation. Um, and similarly, those same primates in hot, dry climates also have more capillaries. Right? And those are tiny blood vessels uh, feeding the sweat glands, water, ions, nutrients um, to better support sweat production. So this is indirect evidence that primates today living in hot, dry climates um, are better able to sweat. Now, we don't have a lot of data or really any data on how most of those species actually do sweat. So we have this indirect data, right? So one of the lessons here for human evolution 
is that getting more sweat glands isn't the only way to get better at sweating, right? There can be evolutionary pressures uh, favoring gland level adaptations. If you get sweat glands that have uh, a better blood supply and more onboard fuel, in theory, they're gonna be able to pump out more sweat for longer, right? So let's look at human evolution. Um, so we're kind of moving forward through evolutionary time. We've just talked a little bit about living primates and going back and seeing um, when different uh, primate sweating traits evolved. So let's move forward to human evolution. <clears throat> now, for those of you who don't know, I should define this term hominins. A hominin is any ape that evolved after the split between the human and chimpanzee lineages. So the dotted line up there, right? So there's the most recent common ancestor, some ape species that lived in Africa between six and seven million years ago. It's, it's no longer around. We're not quite sure what it was. By the way, the person who figures out what that species was, is probably gonna get some kind of big prize, right? Um, and hominins would be any of the species on that line uh, going up to humans, right? So what do hominins look like? What were they? Well, we are hominins. We're the last hominin to survive. Uh, but here's an artist's reconstruction showing most of the known species of hominin. We're gonna talk about some of them. Uh, some key points to keep in mind that um, over the last six million years, there have been many hominin species. And some of the things that they have in common is they all walked upright. They're bipedal, walking on two legs, right? The first ones show up around six or seven million years ago. And as you can kind of see from the pictures, human characteristics did not evolve all at once. And as we'll also see, it, it wasn't just a straight line to humans, right? So um, evolution wasn't trying to make humans. Uh, it was tinkering and experimenting with all different kinds of, of ape-like traits and hominin traits and human-like traits, um, which eventually did lead to us, but it was not a straight line. So let's, um, let's kind of go through hominin time here and look at early hominins. So here's a family tree showing the known hominins. So you can see on the bottom right, these would be our early hominins. So five to seven million years ago, uh, we have pretty good fossil evidence um, for multiple ape species, multiple hominin species living in Africa. Um, we have enough evidence that we've named a genus Artipithecus with several different species. <clears throat> now again, sweat glands don't fossilize. So if we wanna know how these hominins sweated, um, really the clues we can look at are how do we think they lived? And long story short, other than walking upright part of the time, they were very ape-like, we think. So we'll call it emergent bipedalism. They could walk on two legs, <coughs> which by the way, chimpanzees can do. If a chimpanzee wants to display dominance, they will stand upright and it, I guess to other chimps probably looks really intimidating. I think it looks kind of stupid. Um, so you can probably picture some of these early hominins walking like that. Uh, like other apes, they had a fruit and plant diet. And so they didn't have to travel very far to find food, right? So they had low physical activity as do other apes, by the way. Apes are fairly lazy animals. Chimps don't walk more than a mile a day. They don't have to, all their food is right there. So basically they were just apes who walked upright. So what do we think about their sweating? It was probably pretty ape-like, right? So the story doesn't really get any more interesting yet. <clears throat> it gets more interesting with genus Australopithecus, right? So um, there are multiple species of these hominins living in East and South Africa between four and one million years ago. And in some ways, we're really not seeing anything very human-like evolving yet. There's only a modest increase in brain size in these species. But importantly, the diet is shifting, right? So we know from looking at their teeth um, that they were eating a tougher plant diet. Seeds, tubers, stems, the kinds of things that chimpanzees eat today that we call fallback foods, right? Things they eat when fruit is not available. So the climate was changing a bit. Uh, up until this point, most of Africa, we think, was rainforest and starting to cool and dry out. And parts of Africa that are today savanna um, were on their way to becoming savanna, right? They were patchier woodland environments. Um, and so we think that they were actually having to walk to find food, which is not something apes really have to do, right? So here, we're finally seeing, from the waist down at least, a more efficient biped. We're seeing hips and feet and knees and legs that are looking more human-like to help them cover ground, right? <clears throat> so basically, they're walking longer distances to find food. And I think this probably also means they had to be sweatier, and here's why. When you're a biped, you're, speeding, you're uh, trading speed for endurance, right? So anything in Africa that wants to eat you, it's gonna get to eat you. 
By the way, I can't tell you how many times students in my classes say, we evolved to run so we could run away from predators. Try it. No way. Anything that wants to eat you will catch you. We, we can jog forever. I can jog. Uh, we're lousy sprinters. Even Usain Bolt, world record holder for the 100 and 200 meters, he would get eaten by a lion, right? So if these defenseless hominins, Australopithecines, um, uh, one good strategy would be to forage in the middle of the day when other predators are not active, right? So animals who can't cool off, which is most animals, they avoid being active in the middle of the day. If these hominins were foraging for food, walking longer distances in the middle of the day, they could avoid getting eaten, but this would also be an evolutionary pressure um, driving uh, increased sweating capacity, right? So this could be more sweat glands, this could be hair reduction, uh, this could be individual sweat glands better at sweating. <clears throat> and this is our best guess. Uh, we think there probably wasn't a huge increase in number of sweat glands at this point, but rather um, an evolutionary pressure for just better sweat glands. Every gland gets bigger, can produce more sweat, etc. right? Kind of like we saw with those living primates in hot, dry climates, all right? Um, so regardless of when this evolved, um, sweating required less body hair, right? Uh, it's kind of like if you're sweating wearing a lot of clothes, or which is kind of similar to having a lot of body hair, it's not gonna be very effective. So efficient sweating did require less body hair. And again, um, hair doesn't really fossilize. So when did hominins start losing body hair? Some of our best evidence comes from studies of lice, which is kind of fun. So two different research groups um, tried to work out when the different species of lice uh, that live on other apes and live on humans, when they diverged, right? So not to get too gross, but humans have two kinds of louse. There's pubic louse and there's head louse. And that makes sense. There's two different species because those are two different environments, right? But they all came, both of those came from one species. So if scientists can work out um, when those two species of louse diverged, then I think we'll know when uh, hominins last had a full uh, body full of hair, right? Um, two different research teams have worked this out and come up with uh, different answers. Um, Reed et al. 2007 suggests that it was around the time of Australopithecus. So the hominin we're talking about now, about three million years ago. That's when these two louse species diverged, suggesting that's when body hair was starting to thin, and so the lice had to split um, into different regions and different species. Uh, uh, the other group said it was more like two million years ago, which would be uh, in, the, in the genus Homo, and we'll talk about that. Right. So we know so far that sweating evolved in primates closely related to us. We don't know how effective it is. Um, and we know that early hominins like Australopithecus probably had to become a little better at sweating if they were able uh, you know, to make that evolutionary leap, which is eating a different diet, walking longer distances. So sweating had to be part of that. But I did argue that it helped make us human, right? So I'd better actually talk about humans. So let's revisit my initial claim that these sort of milestones in human evolution um, are all dependent in part on sweating. Um, I've made the point that bipedalism and foraging in a more open environment um, required sweating, but I haven't really taken you through the rest of it, so let's do that. So let's talk about the genus Homo, the human genus. Shows up around two and a half, maybe three million years ago. Here they are. Here are some things that make our genus human-like. Uh, we finally see the evolution of bigger brains, bigger bodies. These were small hominins before this point, right? Uh, hunting, scavenging, and gathering were all ways we got food, right? We have evidence of butchery from like three million years ago. So we know that early Homo, maybe even late Australopithecus, was cutting meat off of bones. <clears throat> uh, bigger brains probably means increased social intelligence, at some point the origins of language. And importantly for my point here, uh, increased physical activity, right? Finally, we have a hominin who walks and runs like us, okay? So what's sweating got to do with it? <clears throat> well, first we gotta, talk a little bit about um, the genus Homo, because I want to remind you that evolution was not a straight line to us, right? So for years we thought, um, you know, sort of humans were the evolutionary goal, but we're seeing now that our family tree is actually very, very bushy. So the suite of adaptations that I'm talking about, um, committed advanced bipedalism, big brains, hunting and scavenging, these things that really made us human, they didn't show up all at once, even in, in our own genus, right? So there's a lot of diversity there. Um, some of you may have heard of Homo naledi there on the far right. Uh, just discovered five or 10 years ago, um, 19 specimens in a cave in South Africa. And 
they really look like no other hominin we've ever found. So every couple of years we find a new species and we don't really know where to put them in. Um, most people would say this is a member of genus Homo, but really it's an amalgam of more primitive and more advanced traits. And even within Homo erectus, the species I'll talk about in a minute, who really was on the path to becoming human, right? That's the one species that we think really does lead to us. There was some evolutionary tinkering happening there too. When Homo erectus left Africa about 1.8 million years ago, those skulls there on the bottom, uh, they show a lot, of, a lot of diversity within that one species. In fact, those five individuals were living in the same cave, probably at the same time, and they also display a uh, huge variation in facial traits, cranial traits, um, and even from the neck down, they don't all look the same. <clears throat> so there was a lot of tinkering happening, and uh, so when I'm saying, you know, humans are the sweaty endurance ape, well, in some populations, we were getting there. But there's all these little side branches going on where different versions of upright walking ape uh, was still a pretty successful strategy, right? But Homo erectus, we know, at least in Africa, they were on the path to becoming human. So here's a comparison, a late Australopithecus species on the left, um, and Homo erectus in Africa on the right. And from the neck down, you can see Homo erectus is pretty much human. They've got um, all of the physical adaptations we do. Um, so the ape strategy really here has finally ended, right? And so all kinds of changes had to happen in the body. So we've got shorter arms and longer legs. We've got bigger brains finally. In some African populations, we're seeing uh, brain size about three quarters the size of a modern human. That's a big leap. Hominin brains before this were never really more than half the size of a modern human. We're seeing advanced committed bipedalism with hips uh, reoriented um, so that our, our hip muscles are really more on the side to support one-legged uh, walking, standing, and running. We've got expanded surface area in the knee joints and the hip joints, and we've got fully modern feet with two arches. Uh, these are all skeletal traits that are associated with the ability to efficiently walk and run long distances. So the ape strategy is over. Now we've got a hominin who's traveling longer distances and is very efficient at it. <clears throat> right. But those things don't happen by accident. So the current thinking is, that climate change is actually what drove these, these big evolutionary changes in, in genus Homo, right? Why get bigger brains, longer legs? Why be more efficient at walking if you don't have to? So the evolutionary pressure here may have been rapid climate change, right? So the climate was getting cooler. Uh, it was drying out a bit. We have several lines of evidence showing that the foodstuffs that were available to them would have been very different, harder to find, farther apart. And so now you've got the challenge of trying to find food in this climate. <clears throat> so this, drove, this challenge drove the evolution of our genus, really, and drove the evolution of sweating. So the food is more spread out. Um, these, you know, Eastern and Southern Africa now, uh, at this time, really were fully savanna as they are today. So it's a hot, dry climate. Food is much more spread out. You have to travel to find it. And that drives the evolution of more efficient bipedalism and bigger bodies, right? And with those physical changes, <clears throat> our ancestors were able to um, acquire meat, uh, find different kinds of plant food stuff scattered around the environment, and they may have even been cooking, right? And all of that means a higher quality diet, which finally enables an increase in brain size, right? So again, if big brains were such a good thing, we'd see lots of animals with big brains, but they're not. Big brains cost a lot of energy. So for brains to evolve to get big, we think you need um, the right kind of dietary changes and a selective pressure for increased intelligence. And this would actually do both of those things. Uh, trying to cooperate to find food in an environment like this is very cognitively demanding. And so that could have been what drove the evolution of big brains. And the diet they were able to acquire uh, made that possible. But what's kind of missing from this story is that all of this increases thermal strain, right? If you're walking or running longer distances in the middle of the day when it's 100 degrees, uh, most animals, that would give them heat stroke and they could die. Humans can do that. So sweating here becomes essential. So this is probably with Homo erectus where we see increased sweat gland density uh, and the ability to thermoregulate or cool off the way we do. So that begs the question, uh, you know, what exactly were these hominins doing? Like I said, they were traveling longer distances to find food, but specifically how? Well, one idea is that Homo erectus was a runner. They probably weren't running for fun. That would be stupid. Right? It was two million years ago and food is hard to find and it's hot, you don't go for a jog. 
But um, we do see pretty good evidence that we have evolved to run and that that started with Homo erectus. So at some point, some population of our ancestors probably were relying on running as a survival strategy. The most obvious reason would be to find food. And the only kind of food you really need to run to get is meat, right? If I had more time, I'd show you the video clip. You can Google it. It's called Human Mammal, Human Hunter. Uh, it's a David Attenborough video clip, which is, of course, a little bit problematic, but it's neat. And long story short, basically, because humans can run a long distance uh, at a slow pace in the heat and cool off while we're doing it, we have an advantage over um, all of the African ungulates and other things we might be hunting, like kudu, antelope, etc., who their strategy to get away from a predator is sprint and then rest. They can't pant and cool off while they're running. They can't sweat. And it turns out you really can't pant while you're galloping either because your innards smash up against your diaphragm, right? And so actually running, breathing, and panting don't really work very well in most four-legged animals, including, by the way, your dog. So if you're running your dog in the heat, you have to let it rest, okay? I think I'm guilty of not doing that enough. But anyway, um, modern humans can do this. Some of them do do this. And so we call it the persistence hunting hypothesis. The idea here, because again, we've seen people actually do it, um, you can run an animal to heat stroke, and then you don't need a long range weapon to kill it. Uh, you can actually just smash it with a rock, as, as brutal as that sounds. Um, and I know a guy who actually observed this. They did it with a truck. They drove 10 miles an hour next to a kudu. It's like a big antelope for about half an hour. Um, that's all it took to drive it into heat stroke. And then they got out and the guy killed it with a rock. So yeah, I see you cringing, but that would be a pretty good way to get meat, right? Uh, especially because we don't have evidence for long range weapons for like another million years or two million years after we have evidence for butchery and hunting and scavenging. So Homo erectus was getting meat somehow, and this could have been it. So there's other evidence though that we are sweaty endurance apes, right? That we're actually built for physical endurance in the heat. And let's go back to chimps just two more times <clears throat> because chimps are really fun to look at. So here's a cross section of human muscle. Uh, every one of those boxes is one human muscle cell. And you'll notice that they're different colors. That's because they're actually different types of muscle fibers. So unlike the turkey you have at Thanksgiving, where uh, entire muscles are comprised of one type of muscle fiber, your muscles, every one of them has a mix of fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers, right? Turns out that's pretty unique to humans though. Um, and especially the fact that we mostly have type two or slow twitch uh, muscle fibers, which are built for endurance. That's very unusual because chimps actually have mostly um, type one or uh, uh, strength oriented muscle fibers, right? So there's been evolution in our lineage to, uh, to lose strength and gain physical endurance. And you can see it literally in the muscles, all right? So ape muscle was built for climbing. All other apes are built for climbing, but our muscle is built for endurance. Now, of course, you do still have type one muscle fibers. And these are the muscle fibers that hypertrophy or get bigger when you lift weights. So you can thank your ape uh, relatives for your gains with a Z. For those of you who don't know what that means, it's like getting huge gains. No, okay. It's like, I'm looking for young people in the audience. I'm like, come on gains. Okay, um, love that picture. So yeah, because we are still apes, you can take advantage of that. You have incredible uh, abilities to change your muscles to, um, you know, based on how you use them, but uh, your muscles really are built more for endurance. One more piece of evidence here. Um, they did a uh, phylogenetic analysis, basically looking at um, how much change has there been in the, in the uh, metabolic chemistry of chimp versus human muscle. So the different chemical compounds, the different intermediate compounds uh, that are produced during muscle metabolism. And the uh, circle there in the top left, that's humans, right? That's uh, human muscle. Basically the takeaway is that since the last common ancestor of humans and chimps, um, human muscle metabolism has changed eight times more than that of chimps. So while it's wrong to think of chimps as being like an ancestral ape, in a lot of ways, you know, chimps really kind of just are apes and we're the ones, at least in some ways, who have changed more. Uh, and this is evidence of that. So we've moved away from the ape strategy of strength and instead we have more physical endurance in our muscles, right? So this is evidence of selection for an endurance phenotype versus an ape-like strength phenotype, right? So what about today? What about contemporary diversity in how we sweat? Well, um, most of this research was done in the 60s and 70s. They counted sweat glands in a bunch of people, not as many as you'd like, and that's kind of why I'm doing it again. 
But the general gist um, is that uh, you have more sweat glands on your forehead, hands, and feet than you do anywhere else on your body. But for most of your body, you've got somewhere around 100 sweat glands per square centimeter, which is a lot. But what about variation between populations? Like, after humans left Africa, were there any evolutionary changes in our numbers of sweat glands? Um, a few people have asked this question sort of like back in the day of racist science, right? When um, European scientists really wanted to catalog diversity in people. Um, and I don't think the studies were really very good. Um, and a more recent analysis concludes that any variation that has been observed between human groups is really just due to phenotypic plasticity. Uh, for you non-biologists, that means basically, regardless of what your genes are, um, your biology changes based on your environment, right? So if you grow up in a hot climate, maybe you develop more sweat glands, right? But really, we don't know. This is a really fundamental question, like what is the diversity in human sweat gland density? We really don't know. Similarly, there's this old idea that you can develop more sweat glands if you grow up in a hot climate. Uh, we actually don't know. There's only been two studies that provide a little bit of evidence for that, and their sample sizes were small. So again, we don't really know. But somehow this has sort of made its way um, into popular consciousness. Here's Gray's Anatomy. People indigenous to warmer climates tend to have more sweat glands than those indigenous to cooler regions. Uh, there's no reason to think that. I mean, that's my hypothesis. That's actually kind of become my null hypothesis. But um, that's what we're testing. But really, no one knows. Right? It's really limited to only three studies. So the questions we're asking now, um, for my dissertation research, we're looking at living humans. And we're trying to uh, catalog diversity in, in sweat gland density and see what best explains it. So we're wondering, number one, does childhood climate explain it? So kind of back to this idea, you know, is this true? Um, if you grow up in a hot climate, regardless of your genetic background, will you develop more sweat glands, right? Uh, or is it explained by geographic ancestry? So have there been evolutionary pressures changing the number of sweat glands based on you know, um, where people migrated to after we left Africa? Um, and this research um, is supported by Wenner Gren, the Leakey Foundation, UMass, and so I'm, I'm well situated to ask these questions now. And basically what we're doing is uh, stimulating sweating in people. Uh, mostly college students, and we're counting how many, how many sweat droplets they are making. Um, one sweat droplet corresponds to one sweat gland. So we're looking at six regions of the body um, and sort of uh, trying to see if you know, either where you're from or where your ancestors are from actually have any influence on how many sweat glands you have. Now, I'm right in the thick of this, so this is not going to be as exciting as I'd hoped it would be, but um, I've actually got about 70 people tested so far counted sweat glands in 70 people, but only analyzed results from 53. And so take this with a grain of salt, because I only currently have 14 people from hot climates actually analyzed. And so that sample size right now is too small to be certain about these results. Um, but basically, we're seeing a lot of variation in how many sweat glands people have, right? Anywhere from 62 to 129 glands per square centimeter. That's the range. Forearm, out of the six areas that I've tested, uh, the, uh, the forearm has the most. <clears throat> Now this graph, I know it's kind of hard to see, is plotting body surface area there on the bottom. So basically how much skin you have covering your body versus your six area average sweat gland density. And we see there's a pretty good correlation, which is significant, um, between surface area and average density. So basically bigger people have a lower sweat gland density simply because their skin is more stretched out. It's kind of a blunt way to put it. So we have to account for that when we're analyzing these, these data, right? So really we're looking at um, do people from certain climates or certain geographic ancestries fall above or below the line, right? Do they have more or less sweat glands than you'd expect based on their body surface area? Um, and our current, uh, our current data shows us that surface area is the best predictor. So of course, people with more surface area have a lower sweat gland density. That's not interesting. Age right now is actually a significant factor. So the older people in my study have less sweat glands. I don't think that's real because the oldest people in my study are like me, and I'm almost 38, not that old. Uh, I think that's probably spurious at this point. Um, men in my study have more sweat glands, even considering surface area, that's kind of strange. Uh, and there is a very small effect of temperature and water vapor right now. So people from hotter, wetter climates we're seeing have mm, slightly more sweat glands. Again, uh, the sample size right now is not big enough. Um, check in again in six months, and I'll tell you what it really means. But if we zoom in on uh, just hot climate volunteers, just the 14 
people from, uh, I think, India, Thailand, Cambodia, um, Mexico. I'm trying to think where these people are from. Uh, various hot, hot climates. Um, people from hot, dry climates, uh, it seems they have more sweat glands than people from hot, humid climates. Now, again, I'll be interested to see if this actually holds up when we get more data. Right? This does mirror results we got that I talked about earlier with living primates, right? where uh, it seems that living in a hot, dry climate where sweating is more effective, there seems to be a selective pressure for sweating to evolve there. Right? Does sweat gland density matter at all? Well, it should. It certainly does across taxa. Right? We know that primates who have more sweat glands sweat more and can cool better. And we know it's true within humans, too. Like, well, we know it's true within one human. And here's why. It's sort of indirect evidence. Um, as you're exercising, your body's solution to needing to sweat more and needing to cool off more is to activate more of your sweat glands, right? So I see that as indirect evidence that, yeah, more sweat glands does help you cool better. And you might think, Drew, duh, of course it does. Well, no one knows. No one's actually tested this. So this is our third question, right? Does sweat gland density actually matter? So we've got um, heat-trained athletes riding a bike in a, in a metabolic chamber, in a hot metabolic chamber, where we have medical grade air going in, so we know exactly the flow rate and the concentrations of oxygen, CO2, and water vapor. And actually, I think we set it for higher than 30 Celsius. I think it's um, a little warmer than that. And the outflow air, we measure, again, concentrations of oxygen, CO2, and water. And this lets us calculate how much energy the person's expending, and therefore how much heat they're actually making, and how much of that heat they're actually able to get rid of through sweating. So we're basically going to come up with a heat dissipation quotient. Um, how good are you at getting rid of heat? And we're going to compare that to how many sweat glands people have. And this will be a start to actually trying to quantify, uh, you know, does sweat gland density matter within living humans? I suspect that, you know, maybe once you've got 75 per square centimeter, um, moving up to 125 per square centimeter may not matter. So maybe then we wouldn't expect there to be selective pressure for continued evolution um, of sweat gland density in human populations, but stay tuned. And finally, uh, I feel like we have to end with this because <clears throat> it's March and it feels like May. It's pretty crazy. Um, climate change we saw twice has impacted the evolution of hominins and has also, you know, sweating has been part of the, uh, you know, solution to that. Um, this is a little bit outdated, but I doubt that their, that their findings have changed. Um, this analysis shows that certain parts of the world where people currently live will soon become uninhabitable simply because they're too hot. And these are also parts of the world that don't always have air conditioning because they're poor. But basically, um, you, can, you can basically maintain a, a higher than normal body temperature for about five or six hours, and then it becomes almost lethal, and eventually it does become lethal. And the only way that you can actually cool off is if the air around you is dry enough and cool enough that you can actually lose heat. Right? You can't lose heat if the air is hotter than you are. And certain parts of the world are going to become hotter than you are. And so they're going to become uninhabitable. Um, and I really can't foresee um, any way around that except air conditioning, right? So yeah, it's going to come back to us. This is uh, the third. There's obviously other ways that climate change is a bigger problem. It's affecting the food supply, et cetera, et cetera. But one we haven't thought about much is actually uh, your ability to cool off is going to be compromised. Um, so lots of acknowledgments. Uh, takes an army to do something like this. Uh, and I think I've done that in just about enough time. So thanks for having me. I'd love to have some questions. <clears throat> no questions. Hi. For the phase of the research where we have people, um, where we're actually trying to quantify how well people cool, the ideal thing to do would, would, get, would be to get everyone uh, on the same heat acclimation protocol. So for two weeks, you know, have them to work out in the heat, have, have all of that controlled. And then we could be kind of sure that all of their glands, all their sweat glands have reached their uh, full acclimation status. Um, that wasn't feasible. So instead, I'm basically um, making sure that everyone in my study has been training at least a minimum amount, you know, four to five hours a week in the heat, and I'm looking at the temperatures on the days they're training, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> we are trying to make sure that everyone's as heat acclimated as they can be. And so in theory then, their sweat glands will have more glycogen and more capillaries, and those things are part of actually phenotypic plasticity. Um, but you're right, it would be ideal to actually uh, excise some sweat glands from these people and actually see, okay, well, if number of sweat glands does or does not matter, 
uh, what are the changes happening at the individual gland level. Um, we're not doing that as part of this research, but maybe later. Yeah, good question, thank you. <clears throat> A question about whether evolution through natural selection um, could actually improve the heat tolerance of populations uh, living in places without air conditioning. <clears throat> well, that certainly happened early in the evolution of our genus, right? Um, would that happen now? I doubt it's happening very much now because people who are most likely to die during heat waves are, are the elderly who've already reproduced, right? Um, because evolution really has no teeth uh, after you've reproduced, right? Um, I could envision ways that that could potentially happen. That's kind of like a dystopian future where you know, like despite all of our modern technology, um, we're actually dying because we're not heat acclimated enough. But yeah, that, I mean, there are more deaths in third world nations due to heat than there are in first world nations, right? Because air conditioning does save lives. So I think the answer to your question is yes. A sad yes. Sure. I think that's a great idea. Um, I've had that same thought, which is why I'm thinking that maybe, well, it, it would really help to know what is the minimum number, what is the minimum density of sweat glands you need to, as you said, completely coat the skin surface. Well, as you said, once it's coated, more sweat glands aren't gonna do any good. So um, actually figuring out what that number is, I think would help to answer your question, but I suspect you're right. Future research, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of weird. Um, sweating doesn't work very well when it's humid, and yet we still sweat a lot when it's humid. And even people who've grown up in humid climates, when they reacclimate to hot, humid weather, they still sweat more. So I haven't quite figured that one out. Like if sweating is not effective in, in humid weather, why don't we have adaptations that prevent us from doing it? <clears throat> My unsatisfactory answer is that's a great question and I don't know. Because you'll just keep sweating when it's humid and if sweat is dripping, it's really doing very little. Because kind of getting back to your question, it's, it's heat from the skin that has to drive evaporation of sweat uh, and that's when you're losing heat from your skin. If, if the sweat is just dripping off your skin, you're not losing very much heat at all. So. Yeah. Oh, and actually back to your question, can we quantify sweat gland density in, in preserved tissue? Yes, it's very tedious. Um, I've kind of tried to do it. I've left it to other people to do it. And there are a couple studies out there now looking at really just a handful of people. It takes so long to do it that I think it's in, infeasible to use that method for asking my questions. But that would be an ideal way to do it if you had an army of people willing to give up their skin and an army of people willing um, to do the histology and actually count them under a microscope, yeah. Well, I'm around, so if you want to ask informal questions, um, come on up. Thanks for coming. <coughs> <coughs> <coughs>